Well, I want to thank you very much for inviting me. It's always a great pleasure to be able to come and to talk to people about uh, one of the passions of my, of my life and my career, which is essentially uh, the care of women and uh, all the different things that are rolled into preterm uh, birth and to uh, care of women as well. One of my main interests is preterm birth, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but I also am interested in the mental health aspects because I deal with this every day as well. And I'm going to talk a little bit about maternal mortality because obviously that's the ultimate arbiter for us uh, when we talk about the ultimate thing that can happen is maternal mortalities. Um, I'm not going to do breast cancer tonight because I think that's just was going to be too much for us and that can be perhaps another time we could talk about that, Peter. But I appreciate you saying I could do that. <laughs> there are no commercial products. I'm not being supplied or told by anybody to do this. All the opinions are my own. Anything as bad as mine and anything as good belongs to somebody else, right? Yeah, the usual, the usual disclaimer. For those of you who are like my lovely first wife, Catherine, as I call her, that you're very German, you need Ordnung, Ordnung, Ordnung. So this is what we're going to start with. We're going to talk about objectives, mental health. We'll talk about maternal mortality rates, a little bit about preterm births, just to talk about some of the other things, uh, a few other issues, and then we'll have some conclusions and hopefully we have some time to talk later. I'm an old debater, I talk rapidly. If I'm going too fast, please raise your hand, I'll try to slow down. I, I promise I will, but I do speak rapidly. I know I speak American English, so it's not really English, but I'll try. <laughs> well, part of this whole idea is back during uh, Roe v. Wade in 73, it brought about abortion on demand, and here in the UK, you had the Abortion Act in 1968 and brought uh, abortion to uh, your uh, part of the world as well. If you look at it, since we've had elective abortion in the United States, we've had 50 plus million fetal deaths. There's been about 10 million fetal deaths in England and Wales since about 68. And there's been some devastating effect on women's uh, health, and I'm going to hopefully share those to you. There's also a damning silence, as I call it, in the mainstream media to not even uh, discuss or engage in this discussion about what the data really does say and being willing to openly, as, as physicians and as a, as a society, talk about perhaps we need to discuss these uh, complications and make it part of our informed consent as we talk to our women and as a part of me providing this health. And there's a huge silence and a refusal to acknowledge in the medical literature about, about these particular issues. So we're going to talk, understand the context of it. We're going to know about it, the impact. We're going to discuss some of the psychological things. We're going to talk about mortality. We'll talk about preterm birth and we'll know why consent for is critically important for women. You have to know that if you're going to have a procedure done, that there are consequences. As I always tell people, there's no zero-sum game. If you're going to make it legal and you're going to have it available, then there ought to be an informed consent, just like there is for every procedure that I do, hysterectomy, cesarean sections, and, and the like. Well, what about the psychological effect? If you look at a large database study that was actually done in the um, California database looking at health claims over four years in California, there were 63% more, more mental health visits 90 days after a pregnancy in a, with abortion compared to delivery. There are 21% more mental health visits over the four years after abortion and 154% increase in suicide during that four-year period. Now, this is just a small snapshot over four years of public health data <laughs> that is obtained from Medicaid data in the, in the state of California. So in my opinion, this seems to point to us that something here is going on that's more than just uh, postpartum depression and the other things everybody talks about how high those are after delivery and that there's no difference. There clearly is something going on here with abortion. There are 460% more likely to have uh, illicit drug use, about 120% increases in alcohol consumption and subsequent pregnancies after their abortion, 65% more likely to have high risk for clinical depression with abortion compared to delivery. So in other words, if they have a pregnancy that they have uh, uh, either a history of uh, postpartum depression and or other depression, they have a much higher risk for postpartum depression and or depression during their pregnancy. If I look at my own personal experience, and this is of course anecdotal, so of course it's not research as such, but I can honestly tell you that virtually almost all the patients I see who have have a history of a significant history of depression or some sort of bipolar disorder almost all have a history of either abortion and or abuse or both. And almost all the patients who are using substances are almost all this similar group of patients. So there is a definite link, I believe, to the use of substances and alcohol with regard to, to induced abortion outside of the usual uh, cofactors that are quoted. 
a 34% increase in generalized anxiety, much higher in Hispanics, probably because of the, the background in the Hispanic family, 42% higher risk in unmarried women. That seems obviously a cofactor that causes them to have increased risk for uh, anxiety, and 46% higher risk of anxiety if they're under 20 years of age and they have an abortion compared to those who do not have a, an abortion or a lot with those ending in a live birth. And these are pregnancies ended in abortion or live birth. And they're all unintended pregnancies, which of course in my world is the big cofactor, you know, well as an unintended pregnancies, so of course there's, you know, cofactors. Well, these were all unintended pregnancies that were looked in. And this is a national survey data from uh, the, uh, uh, basically the national, uh, our national health service, essentially. If you look at the effect of sleep disorders compared to abortion to birth at the end of pregnancy, a high, much higher risk of sleep disorders six months after an abortion compared to birth, 68% higher at a year. Still, all the way across this, much, much, much higher rates and sustained rates. And that's part of the problem with this whole business is that when you look at data, and we've talked a lot about epidemiology, we talk a lot about this, and, and, and Margaret and I and, and uh, Greg have talked a lot about this. The problem is, is that when you look at things from an epidemiological and or a clinical standpoint, you have to have the right endpoints, you have to have the right data points, you have to ask the right questions. Well, it may or may not be elevated at one year, it is, but it's certainly sustained, which shows that this is not a benign effect that goes away relatively soon. You still have a, a really large number of patients after an abortion that are suffering from significant anxiety and depression. If you look at uh, seventh, uh, 65, 7th, 7 11th graders who are boarding or giving a birth, they had about split between the two, looking at sleep problems, marijuana. 5%, five times more likely to seek counseling, had much higher frequent sleep issues, even though small stata and status, and also a lot more likely to use THC. And that's also been my experience. All my patients, that, I have a lot of patients use THC because, of course, it's natural, right? And, of course, the Hemp Society has been very good and clever about their marketing. But the THC is also used as a, as a drug of choice for people who've had, who have mental health issues and have had abortions as well. Just to mind what an 11th grader is. 11th grader is a junior in high school, I'm sorry. So age. sixth, age. oh age, about 16 or 17. So uh, eighth grade, sixth grade is probably about 12. 12 to about 16 or 17, maybe 18 at, at maximum. I'm sorry. I keep forgetting it's a different. THC? Tetrahydrocannabinol, marijuana, sorry, marijuana. Yeah, yeah THC is, yeah, marijuana. Doobie, for those of you who are more in the know, doobie, yeah. Blunts, 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 anybody? No, we don't know about blunt, blunts. Yeah. We'll talk about that. So what I want to talk about, this is probably the, the best study that's probably been done, uh, in my opinion, probably overall on uh, mental health and, uh, and abortion, actually. And it was done by um, a good friend of mine, uh, Priscilla Coleman, and she published in the New British Journal of Psychiatry. And it took her a long time to get this published. I remember her talking, and this took her a year, year and a half to get published. I mean, it went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And it was actually one of the few meta-analyses that actually came out with a, <laughs> with a clinical opinion to, with it, okay? A, a clinical commentary with it. That was the way they published it, you know, talking about her data and her, liter her literature. What she did is she used 22 st studies with 36 measures of effect. Now, this is incredibly important because she looked at numerous, numerous, numerous cofactors. There were almost 900,000 participants, and out of that, there was about 20% uh, plus or minus with elective abortion. So a very, very large sample, a very large number of studies, a very large number of effects that she looked at and ran the data. So very, very meticulously done. Priscilla's a, a psychologist, uh, uh, sort of like the family training, PhD, really, really good, does good stuff. What she found was that following a, at least one abortion, 81% increase for mental health issues. So that's very interesting. 55% increased risk of mental health issues, even when comparing them to unintended pregnancies, which are supposed to be the ones that make you the most anxious, the most depressed, the most whatever. Even if you had an unintended pregnancy and you had your live birth, compared to an abortion, you still did way worse with your abortion. I always love that. My pregnancy was accidental. I go, well, how does that happen? Did you like, bump each other in the hallway? I mean, what do you mean unintended? I just don't understand that. That's just me. I'm an old curmudgeon kind of guy, I don't know what to say. So, <laughs> so she looked at the subtypes of mental health issues. Again, very high increase in anxiety, increase in depression, alcohol abuse. I mean, you look at they're trying to basically trying to drown their sorrows. Marijuana use again, trying to cover up and cope with all this, and 155% increase in suicidal behaviors. So this is extremely serious business. 
But the worst thing about this is it's very interesting. Priscilla's very clever. She talked about using a population attributable risk, which means you, you separate out all these cofactors and you drill it all down and you sort of sift it all through and you do the statistics. She said there was at least a 10% incidence of mental health problems directly attributable to abortion. At least 10%. So in my mind, that seems to be fairly significant. If you're worried about a one in 10 chance of someone having a significant, not just a minor, but a significant depression, anxiety, suicidal, a substance, alcohol abuse issue, 10% of the population, that seems to me to be something you probably need to talk to somebody about. I have to talk about, to, with my patients, a risk of one in perhaps 10,000 for transfusion with every surgical procedure I do and document it. One in 10,000, not 10%, one in 10,000 risk. And a one in 100,000 of dying, right? Plus or minus. But nobody talks about this with abortion. Seriously, They're, they don't believe this. But it's there, and it's been there for a while. So next I'm going to shift. Any questions about the mental health thing? And we can talk later perhaps if you got a question now. That's quick. I'm sort of skating the surface here. Yes? Just clarify, attributable. Does that equal causality? No. Not causality, attributable sort of like association. The idea that, for instance, if we look at the, the cigarette data, is very similar. You never proved you got lung cancer from tobacco, right? We never proved that. It was just an association. The association with lung cancer probably is on the same, same level or a little bit, maybe a little bit higher. About 10 or 15% or less of people who smoke chronically over time will get lung cancer. It's a very similar idea. It's an association, but it's clearly very strong here in this instance. The other thing is a, is a, is a myth of, uh, of maternal mortality, and I love this because, of course, I love every time somebody comes out and says something like this. It says the risk of death associated with childbirth is 14 times higher than abortion. Well, that sounds pretty bad. Maybe you should never get pregnant ever, right? Because, gee, you, you know, without an abortion, you're going to die. Well, I know everybody knows this, really. We talked about this, actually, Margaret and I said there are three kinds of lies. There's lies, there's damn lies, and there's statistics, right? And I always tell people, be very careful. My residents, I'm very careful. Look at the population. Look at your confidence intervals. Look at the question. Look at what you're actually asking. Look at the confounders. And look, in, in fact, in what, where it comes from and who wrote it. And then go through and figure out what the actually is being said and what the, actual out, what the actual findings really are. Well, the problem with, of course, abortion mortality rates are protean particularly in my country, and even in your country, because you don't always link the abortion numbers with the patients that have had them, right? That doesn't always happen. Now, they fortunately do that in some other places, and I'll hopefully get to that, I think, in a little bit. But basically, there's no, there's no law to report abortions in my country. Okay, it's voluntary. And three large states don't even report them to the CDC, right? They don't, we don't report. Um, they don't have to report complications. They're supposed to, but again, that's voluntary. Definitional incompatibilities mean there's different ways of saying the same thing, multiple different ways, and they don't, they don't necessarily jive very well. Again, voluntary data collection. Uh, this big one is research bias. We don't really want to know. Reliance on estimates. Every time I see this, I go, well, that just means we're lying again because you're estimating because you don't really know. Political correctness, I cannot tell you how many times I've had people tell me, you know, you can't say that because you shouldn't. I go, well, if it's the truth, it shouldn't be politically incorrect. It should just be the truth. And it's self-evident. It should stand for itself. And if you prove me wrong, I'm okay. I will change my mind. I've actually changed, believe it or not. I may be wrong, but never in doubt. But I have changed my mind over, that's true. <laughs> it's like, you know, if they want a second opinion, no thank you. I like mine just fine. I don't need your second opinion. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. My residents just, yeah, they just laugh. Inaccurate and complete death certificates, or like the old famous roundhead general you'll appreciate. If you're going to sin, sin boldly. Yeah, remember that one? Yeah. Failing to include all causes of death, such as suicide, which is a big, big problem, right? If you don't have enough time, again, it's like a lot of stuff. If you don't collect the data related to when you had the death, you can't relate it back to, to mortality, to either abortion and or to pregnancy, right? Incompatibility with maternal mortality statistics, which of course they don't even match up. I have two or three systems in my country. They don't talk to each other, believe it or not, in this age of computers, they still don't talk to each other. Find that hard to believe, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you look at some of the stuff that Dr. Uh, that, uh, that Micah Gisler has done, some very interesting things, and actually Dave Rudin has done, that uh, looking at some stuff. And they looked at all-cause death rates. Now that's what's important because it's not just about deaths from abortions, right? It's all cause death rates. We're a much higher woman delivering with one year of an abortion compared to delivering women. 
They also found death rates were 50% higher in aborting women compared to non-pregnant women. So the safest thing in Finland to do is get pregnant and have a baby because your risk of dying was half what it was everybody else's, right? That's the thing I would take from that. I'm just kidding. But that's what it says, right? An 80% higher risk of dying in an accident is what uh, Reardon talked about. And this goes with the high risk behaviors. This goes with alcohol. This goes with drugs. This goes with self-loathing. This goes with all the things that go along with the depression and the anxiety that go along with the, the abortion issue. And these are real things and real numbers. And this is very, very, very good data. Pretty well linked and pretty well um, covering most of the deliveries and most of the uh, abortions in their time frames that they looked at. So good data. Well, what about causes of death? Violent causes, meaning you're, you're, you died by the hand of, a, say, of somebody who you knew. Suicide, we've already talked about. Accidents, quote unquote, accidents. 82%. All natural causes are increased, probably because you have some things going on that uh, are not natural with abortion, correct? They have uh, increased risk for HIV and AIDS, circulatory diseases, whatever happens to these patients also affects their heart, probably cytokines, inflammatory uh, response, other things that happen with uh, uh, doing surgery and any uh, strokes much higher, other heart diseases all increase looking at some of these things, which are sort of interesting, aren't they? But you look at, start looking at other things dying within 42 days to a year after a pregnancy and saying, well, in abortion, they're all increased compared to having a baby. In spite of everything I hear, right? I see patients every day who everybody says, well, you know, you need an abortion. I said, why? Well, they said I have a heart disease. I said, so? What does that mean? Well, I have a, I have a heart this. I go, well, why can't we just take care of you? Why don't we just do good care? I think this really means you're more likely to die in the surgery for the abortion than you are with pregnancy, trust me. I've been doing this a long time. Also, if you look at, by weeks, just, by weeks looking at numbers of weeks you have, the maternal mortality rate is essentially the same if you look at it from 16 to 20 weeks, which is when second trimester abortions are done. They're virtually the same. And the real, real secret in here is that they don't do week by week looking at death. You can't compare a six-week or seven-week DNC to a term pregnancy. Correct? That is simply the wrong comparison. Also, they pull out and do all sorts of interesting things, like they pull out all of the, um, uh, or they put all the ectopics, I'm sorry, all the ectopics and people that die from DNCs with spontaneous miscarriages into the maternal mortality rates, which are not, not right, because that's not about delivery, that's first trimester. Correct? That has nothing to do with having a baby at 36 or 37 weeks. So that's, again, that's in falsely inflating the numbers on the maternal mortality side. So you're playing with the statistics. If you look at maternal death by the World Health Organization, it says it's within 42 days of termination of pregnancy, irrespective of duration or site, does not include suicide, homicides, or accidents. Bad data, okay? Every time they say that, I go, no, nah, that's not good data. Late maternal deaths are the deaths of a woman from direct or indirect more than 42 days, but less than one year. So that's late maternal deaths. Pregnancy, isn't this great? See how this gets better and better and better, right? Pregnancy-related deaths are those from direct and indirect causes as the death of a woman while pregnant, irrespective of the cause of death. So this is those things that happen, like you're talking about, uh, say, for instance, um, preeclampsia or, and or uh, perhaps uh, something that happened from hemorrhage or it could have been an accident afterward or something like that. Direct obstetrical deaths are things that happen in labor. Preeclampsia, uh, surgery that you had, uh, postpartum hemorrhage, uh, sepsis, those things. But these are all the pregnancy-related deaths, and that should include these, but it may not. Indirect. Now, see how this gets really weird? I mean, it depends. And what's really interesting, it depends on how you code it, right? Depends on how you code it, how it gets counted. So that's why it's always very difficult for me to look at stuff sometimes and go, well, I don't know what definitions you're using. I need to know so I can figure it out. These are resulting from previous existing disease or that developed during pregnancy, which was not due to direct obstetrical causes, aggravated by the physiological effects of pregnancy. So in, in, other, in other words, if you had a history of congestive heart failure and the, perhaps this pregnancy about, you know, aggravated your congestive heart failure, you ended up in peripartum cardiomyopathy and had issues or died from that because you not because of the pregnancy, but as an indirect cause later after the pregnancy was done. So pregnancy-associated deaths was a Center for Disease Control and also ACOG. And they said that it's death from any cause during pregnancy or within a calendar year of delivery or pregnancy termination, regardless of duration of the anatomical site. The problem with that, of course, is they put, like I said, they put ectopic deaths 
in the maternal death side instead of putting in the abortion side. And they do it all the time. I mean, this is like standard practice. The other thing, of course, is that ACOG doesn't tell you is that what I just told you at the beginning of this, there is no data for the number of abortions that are performed in the United States. It's an estimate. It's an estimate. Theoretically, we get all the mortalities, right? The problem is you don't have the denominator, right? So you don't have the denominator, you can't calculate anything. And that's the real issue in the United States. Everything that's done is estimates. So this does include accidents, homicide, and suicide related to pregnancy if it's coded. If it's coded. If it's coded. I can tell you my country, I've been involved with this more than more for a long, long time. I've had people that have died from quote unquote septic abortions, and it's counted out as a, as a maternal mortality, and there's no relation to abortion. It's just dropped off of that. It's never reported. Because that's not the inciting event, quote unquote. It was sepsis. Well, why did you get septic? Well, because I had a, an abortion. Well, we're not going to put that. We're just going to put sepsis. Yeah. Another way to define this, and this is, just, this is why I said this is why this gets really weird really fast, right? Is it's, there's a number of known legal abortion, induced abortion related deaths per 100,000 reported legal induced abortions, which I told you we don't report. <laughs> I love this stuff. It cracks me up. I'm just saying, it just makes me laugh. That's why when people talk about truth, I go, you got to decide what you mean by truth, okay? And let's talk and define it here. Assumes all deaths are identified from all causes up one year post abortion. <laughs> However, the total number of abortions, as I talked about, is not known. Therefore, you're unable to calculate it. Right? You really can't calculate what you don't know. I mean, they try to. They play like they do. So, these are only two criteria that they talked about in identifying maternal death, medical cause of death, and the timing of the pregnancy related to the death. So they don't talk about abortion necessarily. I know everybody likes Lewis Carroll. I like Lewis Carroll. So, this is the Cheshire Puss. You know the story, right? Alice goes up to the Cheshire Puss and says, you know, which road should I take? And the Cheshire Puss says, well, where do you want to go? And she says, well, I don't know. And he said, well, then it really doesn't matter which way you go, does it? If you don't know which way you want to go with your statistics, or you don't know what the statistics are, then it really doesn't much matter which way you go now, does it? Because you're not going to get where you want to go necessarily, in spite of what he, Lewis Carroll will say, right? So we usually do maternal mortality in my world as the number of maternal deaths during a given period per 100,000 live births during the same period. And it's a given period of or a number of, of women of reproductive age during the same time period. So it can be during live births or reproductive age. If you want to make it look worse for pregnancy, you do this one. If you want to make it look different and have more fun with it, you do it reproductive age, which can dilute out the effect of your abortion, right? So this is, this is pregnancies, this is abortions. So see how you can dilute it out? We can use all you people who are 18 to 45, and then we'll only use the people who gave live birth. And see how you can change it? 10 over 4 million, 10 over 1 million. See how you can change it? Be very careful. Definitions are important. So we talked a lot about this. Maternal mortality and abortion statistics are not analogous, particularly in my country. Abortion statistics are by trimester. Maternal mortality ought to be done by the same. So if you want to do it, you do it by weeks or you do it by trimesters. If you look at the statistics done by trimester, you find out that mortality rates for abortions really are more in the range of 76 per, per, or 77 per 100,000. Maternal mortality at term is about 10. So if you look at these statistics and you look at abortions, and even though they've tried to say, oh, we've changed that, it's much safer, if you drill down in it, they are not safer, especially if you include all-cause mortality rates in these Suicides, homicides, all the other things that go on, these are, these are much higher for abortions. Questions on that? That's sort of a high, high sort of view on mortality rates. Again, yes, ma'am. So when they register, do you have to register an abortion with any registry no. in America? No. There is no registry for abortions. It's voluntary. The abortion providers are supposed to report it, but it's voluntary. And the states are supposed to, um, some states that make it, it's supposed to be a requirement, but it's still, legally in West Virginia you're supposed to, but a lot of places it's voluntary. And in West Virginia it's really voluntary. So unless you actually get money from the state and do Medicaid, there's no way to trace it. There's no way to tell that. You can't find them. And then the states are not required to report to the, uh, to the Centers for Disease Control. It's a voluntary reporting from the public health systems in each state. And certain states don't report it at all. Like, I don't think California reports at all. 
Yeah, yeah. So probably about. Practice that can shame the other state. <sighs> probably not, because basically nobody wants to know. I mean, let's be honest. What what would there? What's what's the point of knowing this from the other they side? Care right? about their women. Well, though. I understand that you and I would say that because you care about your women, but most states are not doing this very well at all because there's no there's no linkage to to payment in the public system in particular and in the private system none at all. But that's one thing we do have in Britain. Yes. Is since right. 1968, every abortion is meant to be registered. Right. In fact, they don't link it. Right. They don't put the NHS number on it. Correct. They can't see the side effects. Right. Is the problem. Right. You're not We're linked. For 50 years. Right. Your bad is not people. linked. Not linked. We need the epidemiology, but at least they do have to record it. Right. Abortion. Yeah. They they so theoretically are supposed to, but some states don't even have. I don't think they even have manual reporting, as I recall. You're supposed to, but again, and then they don't have to report to the to the CDC. So these are all estimates. Remember, that's the problem. This whole business in my country. It's very, very fraught with. Uh, which, which countries do you think have the best abortion-related maternal mortality data? In, in the probably the best data is probably Finland. Uh, Denmark's pretty good. Uh, Holland's isn't bad. Um, Germany's pretty decent, but probably Finland has some of the best. And why is their data so much? They have a they have a, a, a they have a link system where every everything that everybody does with their socialized medicine practice that they have there in a small country and rather homogeneous is all linked. Every medical thing that they do, every prescription, every visit, every procedure is all linked and follows them with that number throughout their whole life. So it's very very strong data. Link data is the best, obviously, and they have all the cofactors like smoking and other things. They have the social um, denominators. Yes. Yeah. Abortion versus birth. Over what time period is that? That was about a four or five year time period, as I, as I recall. That was some of the data from uh, California, as I recall, some of the California Medicaid data. So, again, short periods of time. It wasn't, long, it wasn't like 30 year data, you're right. No, it wasn't long term looking at overall from, you know, from the time you right. had your abortion. That makes it even more worrying, doesn't it? Right. You know, the woman's going to have a stroke within four right. years of an and part of that's because of the whole idea that we have a lot of, you know, there's a lot of thrombophilias in the, in the United States. You know, factor five lied in my country is 5%. In my world, I have all sorts of weird, crazy thrombophilias. And, of course, I have 65% or 55% of my women smoke, believe it or not, while they're pregnant. So I have a huge tobacco abuse problem. So that, of course, also plays into this whole, you know, stroke and thrombosis and cardiac problems that we see as a cofactor. Preterm birth, we heard a lot about that. So I'm going to talk, I'm sort of going to gloss over a little bit, and I may skip some slides. What I really want to talk about is looking at the incidence of preterm birth roughly is about 6, depending where you're at, to 12% a year. In the United States, we have 3 to 4 million births a year, so that's about 180,000 to 240,000. The very preterm birth, which is what Dr. Gregg talked about, is less than 1%. There are 30 to 40,000 births. However, when I did a study on this, and this was in 2003, I think, with Brent Rooney, we looked at this. And we had to do some estimating because we didn't have all the abortion statistics, and we tried to do some look at this. We found that there was probably $1.2 billion a year just to preterm births uh, associated with abortion. Now, that does not include all the follow-on costs, which are in terms of the, the social services, the physical therapy, the occupational therapy, all the things that are going to be required for all the children who have significant issues because of preterm birth, particularly below 28 weeks, the very preterm babies that we see as a result, of which, as you saw, is the highest number, the highest risk is having a very preterm baby with an, one abortion and then multiplied after you hit three. So we, we said the low birth weight, very low birth weight. We talked a lot about that. Low birth weight for us is less than 2,500 grams. And most of the time in literature, very low birth weight is less than 1,500. And the, uh, um, the sort of preterm is above 34 weeks is really above 2,500 grams, at least when they talk about it in my literature. Weeks gestation is the other way to do it, obviously. Well, what about very low birth weight? And these are child, this is a child less than 28 weeks. Virtually about a quarter of a million dollars U.S. versus eight or nine thousand dollars. Low birth weight costs about thirty thousand dollars, and cerebral palsy, which of course is the big bad actor, increases by about thirty-eight to forty times. So that's where the problem lies when you have very low birth weight children. Is you have this increased risk of cerebral palsy with intraventricular hemorrhages and this and the infections and other things that go along with with being born very prematurely. And this is well substantiated data. It really hasn't changed much over the last uh, last few years, except for. We've started doing some things that may help that with the delayed core clamp. 
So why do we think we have preterm birth? And I, I mean, I'm always, I mean, being the scientist and the guy always kind of wants to know why, I'm always a little red-haired Irish boy, I used to be, in the back saying, you know, why does that happen? You know, I just kind of want to know why. Is there something that I can do to make it better? Can I treat it? Why does this happen? Well, we think it's probably trauma with, with damage, with dilatation and curatage with the surgical abortions. And I'm not going to talk much about medical right now because there's not really good data on that that we talked about. Probably ascending infection and low grade, uh, set up a low grade infection inside the uterus, which leads to either premature labor or premature rupture of the membranes. Okay? So, because Dr. Hill did this and because he's from y'all's area, as we call y'all's area, I'm going to talk a little bit about how preterm birth falls into meeting the Hill criteria. Well, there's a very, it's very interesting. The, the effect is, it does meet statistical and clinical significance. We saw you had 22 papers, 23 papers. There's actually over 160 studies that show preterm birth significance. Not all of them are adjusted odds ratios. Not all of them are the greatest studies, but there are very, very good studies and many studies now with preterm birth. The consistency shows that this is, there's none that showed a decrease except the one medical. I think one medical showed a decrease, possibly. But all the, the, the surgical ones show Every study you see that has surgical abortion increases the risk for preterm birth, and they said it by about 50% on the average, which is stunning, actually. And, and everything, all of them show an increased risk of preterm birth. The specificity of it, the preterm birth is specific to this outcome or association. So in other words, you, you have the abortion, and then you're associated with a preterm birth, and the more abortions you have, obviously, the higher the risk, which is this dose response and the temporality. It does not occur prior to the given event. So you don't get preterm birth generally before your, your abortion, unless it's a first pregnancy, which is a completely different discussion since that's not a, an exposed pregnancy, right? Does, the, does the, the plausibility meet the criteria? Yes, because you do this injury to the infection of the cervix and get an ascending infection, and that causes the problem. And we've known this for years in cone biopsies and, and our surgical procedure on the cervix, that those cause an increased risk for preterm delivery. We know that. We've known that for many, many years, actually. Coherence. Does the effect make sense of the outcome? It's logical that surgery and entering the uterus, an undisturbed normal uterus, not a miscarriage, would increase injury and infection and relate to preterm birth. It makes total sense if you think about it. Surgically, forcibly dilating the cervix and doing a DNC on something that's not supposed to have a DNC done on it, a live baby, is extremely traumatic to the cervix and extremely traumatic to the uterus. Is it effects experimentally reproducible in multiple experiments? Yes, this is across everywhere you look at. You look at the German data, the Finnish data, you look at what little American data there is, the, the, the Danish data, the, the Dutch data. In Southeast Asia, there's some papers that talk about the Chinese data, every, every, the Indian data. Across all continents and all people, it's all consistent because it's all the same issue, right? It's all the same thing that goes on. And the analogy, as I call this, is found experimentally like we talked about. Dr. Mark was talking about, is similar to tobacco with its associative findings. In fact, it's probably higher with surgical abortion than it is with tobacco, actually, in terms of the association effects. We talked about a 50% risk, and then the risk going up to two or 300% or more after more than one or two abortions. Well, let's just talk about a couple meta-analysis, and I think these are probably until your paper comes out, <laughs> which I hope to see out soon. Then I can add to my list of papers. Dr. Swingle did one and Dr. Shaw did one. Two meta-analyses that were done about 2009 that were actually quite good. So what Dr. Swingle did is said, okay, let's look at a meta-analysis. These are the U.S. authors. They're from 95 to 2007, so it's a little bit older study. So they said they had two pro-abortion, which I think is fascinating, two pro-life authors, they called it, right? So they're trying to be sort of, you know, um, politically correct, I guess is the word I would use, or unbiased. They believe this has reduced biases, and I probably did. They searched 7,000 titles, and they had 130 papers that they actually finally reviewed. They found 30 papers on induced abortion and 26 papers on spontaneous abortion. They analyzed 12 from the induced abortion because there was some crossover here with spontaneous and nine spontaneous abortion because they did or did not have cofactors, right? Tobacco, other things that they needed to look at as, as uh, uh, sort of uh, confounders, right? So that's why they did that. What they found in four of the 12 studies on induced abortion, they also had common uh, odds ratios for calculation for induced abortion less than 32 weeks. Out of those nine studies for preterm birth with SAB, seven had data for use in calculation. The SAB's odd risk for preterm delivery of, with one miscarriage was increased. No surprise there. If you do surgical, abort, surgical DNCs, you can increase miscarriage. And with miscarriages, you can increase your risk for possible preterm birth there. With greater than two SABs, they also had an increased risk. Again, and the more DNCs, the more the risk. These findings are not unexpected in an analysis of preterm birth. 
The reason women spontaneously miscarry may also predispose them to preterm birth. In other words, because you miscarry is a, is a confounder in the fact of calculating preterm birth because you may have something that makes you predisposed now not just to miscarry but also to have preterm birth. So it's not really very useful, frankly, to be honest. What they did find is that the common odds ratio for the studies for surgical abortion was 1.64. And they said there's a 64% increased risk of preterm birth less than 32 weeks with just one abortion. They also found this, again, preterm birth with SABs, which I, I've already sort of talked about. This is very, very interesting. And in fact, what they've found in their paper is that it's, it's even higher than this, below 28 weeks, right? Even higher than this. And with multiple abortions, it's higher still. Well, what about the Shaw one? Another really, really well done meta-analysis. What they did is they, they, they looked at 834 papers. They excluded this number. They had 69 citations and 32 for lack of data because they couldn't tell some of the confounders and that sort of thing. They had eight studies for low birth weight with about uh, 280,000 people compared a no induced abortions versus one abortion looking at SGA. They wanted to look at small for gestational age. What they found was, is their increased odds ratio was about 35% or 1.35, a 35% increase in patients with only one abortion. Only five of these 18 studies, which is what they've, Margaret and, and uh, they've found out, is that there's not a lot of data for greater than two or three or four abortions. It's just not there. But what they had was five studies. What they found was about, out of about 49,000 patients, they had an odds ratio of 1.72. So again, increased and definitely shows a dose related, demonstrating a 72% increase in preterm rate, uh, uh, rate, birth rate, right? The increase was the most important epidemiological principles of this dose related effect. The more, important, 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 the more abortions you have, the more or the higher the risk for, your, um, for having a preterm birth. So, the criticism, of course, about abortion studies is that all these abortions involve DNCs with excessive trauma, minimally invasive abortions without a, with a, with a, without a DNC or with a, a, an extraction are much less traumatic and it'll be hunky-dory, right? Yeah. Well, not so much. Uh, <laughs> this is a Zao study from, uh, from the Danish study looking at vacuum aspiration and looking at gestational age for very, and below 32 weeks, actually 34 weeks, looking at vacuum aspiration and DNCs, and uh, they still had just doing a vacuum aspiration where you just go in you know, and do the catheter, the vacuum aspiration, early abortion. Uh, not so much. Much higher, of course, with DNC in their, in their small data set. It wasn't as huge, but it was not bad, and they still found that. So, not so much. So, let me go back. How does this pragmatically impact my practice? This is what happens in my world. Everybody who comes in with me is asked about abortions. And they're not asked about it once, they're asked about it about three or four times. And the reason you have to ask three or four times is because people won't tell you about their surgical abortions many times. You have to ask about those and medical abortions and or medical abortion that went to a DNC. The reason you have to ask that is like, does change the way I manage these patients? And if you talk to most maternal fetal medicines, they all now agree. They won't say that, and they won't admit to it, and it's not in the press necessarily, but this is how it works. You come in to see me, if you're pregnant and you've had multiple abortions or an abortion, when you come in to see me in mid-trimester to get your anatomy at 18 to 20 weeks or 16 weeks, you get a cervical length. You also get repeat cervical lengths every one to two weeks until about 26 to 28 weeks. Why do I do that? Because I'm terrified you're gonna have cervical incompetence and I'm terrified I'm gonna to have to treat you, right? And I treat you either with progesterone and or a cervical tie depending on how short your cervix goes. So operationally, I treat everybody who's had these abortions as if they have an incompetent cervix or they've had a history of a preterm delivery whether they've had one or not. So that's the real impact from my side and what, the way it works in my world. That's the way it works in my world. It's as if you had already had a preterm delivery. Enhanced surveillance, cervical lengths, and treatment. Well, what about other issues subsequent to abortion, okay? Again, we talked about the idea of having to use marijuana. We talked about the idea that they're gonna use illicit drugs, heroin, cocaine, methamphetamines, a, whole, a way higher risk to use alcohol. And this is, again, uh, substance abuse and subsequent pregnancies carry to term, and I can't remember the number in that, to be honest with you, how many patients there were. It was, it was a lot, and I don't know which database it was. Um, I'm just, I don't remember. So. Much higher risk for marijuana, crack, cocaine, much higher. Other, uh, for other, uh, other um, stuff, not other, coca other cocaines besides crack cocaine, in other words, you could use you know, injectable or whatever you want to use. Uh, illicit drugs in general, uh, anyone, anyone you want to talk about, ecstasy, you want to talk about 
um, uh, other drugs that can be used, anything from K2, which is a synthetic uh, marijuanas, to methamphetamine, to whatever you want to use. I see a lot of, uh, do you see a lot of Neurontin here being abused? Anybody used the Neurontin? Gabapentin, you see that yeah. abuse here? Gabapentin and Neurontin. Yeah, very great hallucinogen for those who want to get high. We have, we've had to go after that big time. Benzodiazepines, a lot of these. But what's interesting, when they looked at this huge database, which is relatively large, no increased risk with miscarriage or stillbirth in all of these things. So there's something unique, something unique about abortion, and it isn't good. So again, if you're going to do this, you need to tell people you are at increased risk for. And if you've had a previous history of these things, you're at a much higher increased risk of having subsequent substance or depression or anxiety or mental health issues. What about child abuse? This study was done out of the, um, uh, I think this was done out of, um, maybe out of the California data, I think. I'd, be, I'd have to go back and look. They had a much higher risk of child physical abuse, and of course I find that to be very common in my, in my world along with the substances. If they've had a history of an abortion, they have a much higher incidence of child abuse in that, in that subsequent pregnancy with that child and or substance abuse. We've talked a lot about that. The history of uh, miscarriage or stillbirth was not associated with an increased risk of child abuse. Even, uh, un even uh, unintended pregnancies are not at increased, generally at increased risk for child abuse. This is very interesting, and you know, hopefully our, you know, our MPs ought to be interested, as they say, your MPs, I say senators and representatives, the, the administrative people, the, leg the legislators, ought to be very interested in this. If you look at how much does it cost, just, just in terms of my country and tax dollars, if you have a child that's born and lives, there's a 1.4 million on the average U.S. benefit to society, and why is that? They pay taxes. <laughs> they pay taxes. <laughs> this is a, the cost since they never pay taxes and you end up paying for the abortions and you end up paying for all the stuff that goes on with mom, it costs you $200,000. Hmm, let's see, 1.2 million to the positive side, maybe that should be okay. A child born puts $200,000 into the U.S. Treasury. A child aborted costs us $32,000 on the average of the cost of the U.S. Treasury. And this is way back in 2005. So it's, it's, and due to inflation, it's higher than that now. So on the average, it's cost benefit to have children. And I've told, you know, I, I used to love it when people come up. We had lots of kids, most of which were, we had four adopted actually, and one, one uh, we call our bonus child, the princess. Mm -hmm. And then we just, uh, we just have our six, a six year old, we just adopted our grandchild. And so we used to go in the, the uh, we had a handicapped girl at the time. So we go in the checkout line. I love this, this is great stuff. Go in the checkout line, they say, well, don't you, you need to know about, uh, you know, about birth control. And I looked at myself, oh, no, 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 no. We want a whole bunch more kids than this. So this is just a start. They go, well, what do you mean? I said, well, when I get old, I need people to pay Social Security and support me, right? Come on, really? Who's going to take care of me in my old age if I don't have a bunch of children? I used to tell them all of a sudden, the only reason I had you so I could you could mow the lawn for me, frankly, but that's another whole discussion. Well, what about, what, so what are our conclusions? Women really do deserve to know this stuff. Right? You deserve to know this. Women deserve to know this. And, and we need to, to keep sharing this information with medical people and with our legislators and all our people and barristers, perhaps, maybe help us out too on that to get, you know, help us a little bit with this. There are significant psychological effects. There are increased risks of suicide. There's a huge increase in anxiety, increase in sleep disorders. We talked about that at six months and it's all the way elevated up to three and four years afterwards. There's an increased all-cause mortality, much higher the first year after an abortion. Increased preterm births, we talked about at least 35 to 64%. It may be on the average 50 plus percent. And we know that greater than 32 or less than 32 weeks, it may be a much higher, maybe two or 300% looking at the new papers and the new data with an increased uh, risk with more than one abortion and with a dose effect. Huge increased uh, incidence of illicit drug use. Way increased risk for child abuse, and this is held out across multiple things. And it's also a very, very, very high cost of society. I mean, just in terms of the financials and the amount of care it takes to do this, is a very, very large amount of money for us. We have some, uh, I have references, and you can have the, um, what do we got? Dr. Uh, Mark has graciously, uh, offered to, um, I guess, sell his book to you guys, too. I'm not doing a commercial. I'm not getting anything on this, right? I'm just telling you that, right? I'm not an author. I'm not an editor. Whatever. It's a good book. And I would challenge you to probably grab one of those. Um, it's going to come out in the second edition, he said, hopefully next year, but we'll see. Get, it, get them while they're hot, so to speak. And um, use this, because it's written for you and for people to read on their own, because it really does talk about choices. And the most disturbing thing to me about this whole discussion is, is that these are never presented as choices to people. If you're not given informed consent and you're not talked about what can happen, 
What kind of a choice do you have? You're not being given a choice. You're not being given a choice. You're just, you're just being operated upon. You're not being allowed to make a, an intelligent decision as a young woman that will affect you for the rest of your life and will probably affect you adversely. And it may not come today, but if you look at the data, there's a huge number of people that will be severely affected. And it will may not be that one year, but it will be 10 or 15 or 20 years later. Comments, questions, thank you very much for your attention. I think I'm done, Peter. Is that good? Is that what you want? So we have plenty of time for questions. We have plenty of time for questions. I'll try to repeat them too so I can get them on camera if they want. Yes, ma'am. Um, we're trying to, uh, the powers that be are trying to move away from surgical abortions to medical abortions. Right. What's the difference in possible side effects? The question was what about medical versus surgical? I think there's going to be very little. There's actually some new data that just came out of a Swedish study that was just published in the BMJ actually. And they looked at their complication rate and over the last few years when they went to home abortions with, the, with medical, their complication went from about 4.5% to almost 9%. And, um, and significant complications actually are elevated, and you've got to kind of read a little bit more closely, but they hit a lot of the more complicated uh, complications in, in uh, the way in which they coded them. So again, I think you're going to see just as much, uh, as many complications from medical as you are other. Now, the preterm birth will have to see about how many of those end up, but if you look at those that end up with DNCs after a medical abortion goes awry, their risk for preterm birth is, is in, the, in the, the three to four times increased risk uh, over the baseline if they have to have an abortion, medical abortion completed surgically. So it's a very high risk for low, below 20 mis uh, preterm deliveries. Plus, there's some other stuff that Priscilla Coleman's talking about. We're working on some of that. It's a little messy, but um, there's probably even more deeply disturbing psychological things that happen with an, with a, an abortion you do at home by yourself, quote unquote and you're aborting your child at home in the toilet, which is just really bad, right? Yeah. So the data's not there yet, but we're working on that. I don't think it's gonna, I think the data's gonna be very similar in many respects. Yes, sir. I, I found the most astonishing thing that you said this evening was that this differential in preterm birth actually affects your clinical management of mm. all the women who come to you in pregnancy. Now, two things stemming from that, I guess. One is that, if you are doing that and others aren't, there should be a lessening of your hmm. rates of premature birth and possible the rest of it. And secondly, surely there are going to be court cases arising in due course when women discover that they haven't had appropriate Well, it's a good point about talking about how we manage things and about how people may or may not be doing this. Operationally, when I talk to most of the MFMs I know, and I don't know everybody, we're operationally treating these people, particularly if they've had DNCs of any sort, particularly abortions and or surgical DNCs, as if they have a very high risk. And most of us are. Maybe they aren't. Part of the problem is to try to get uh, the legal field to come with us and to let to work with us to help bring these cases forward. And that's very difficult to do, to be very honest with you. Uh, it's, it's just tough to do that because a lot of people don't want to get involved because of the previous history and, you know, blaming mom, which I'm not. And, 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 I, and I do think I have better outcomes because I'm so... Uh, so aggressive in my management and so um, uh, focused on this whole aspect of preterm delivery with this and, and other issues that go on. Somebody had a question? Yes, ma'am. Have you got any data on women who've um, stopped halfway through a medical abortion? How about women who have halfway? Yeah, there's some good stuff. Actually, I don't have a lot of good stuff on that. There's actually, um, oh, small stroke here. Um, the... Uh, it's the progesterone reversal group, and I'm trying to think who, uh, what their website is. I don't have that off the top of my head, but uh, George Delgado has done a lot of work on that, the, the reversal, progesterone for reversal of medical abortions, and he's got some really good data that he's actually put together. Some of it's a little messy, I will admit that, and he's actually looking at possibly working on a new protocol for that, so keep your, your ears and eyes open, but there have been su successful reversals of the, um, of the abortion pill. So is it psychologically if you stop halfway? Oh, you mean and then continue? And then can, you're, talking about, oh, you're talking about those who don't complete the abortion? Well, really what's interesting is those women are very glad they didn't abort for the most part because that's why they quit. They were ambiguous, and nobody picked up that they were ambiguous. They just handed in the pills and said, go home and do your abortion. I mean, if you weren't ambiguous about it and weren't, you know, you would have completed it. You wouldn't have stopped partway through, and now you're desperate. You've taken the one pill, and now you want somebody to help you, and that's how this whole reversal uh, thing came about was that progesterone reversed the effects of the, the RU46, which is a progesterone blocker, right? You had a question, Ms. Margaret? Um, I forget where I was, sorry. 
That's fine. We have another one over here. We'll come back. Oh, yeah. It was just to do with um, chicken and egg, really. That when you said people take drugs, how do you know they didn't take drugs before? They drugs? Well, that's and that's part of the that's that's the way the discussion always goes. But I what's that's similar with mental health? Sure. Problem, sure. Say, how right. Do you know it's the abortion that triggers this? Did right. They have that's why it's really critically important to do the epidemiological studies and get large numbers of patients. And two, we have to believe that people, one, most of the time when they come in, usually try not to, try not to lie to you about their mental health, because they will usually admit to that, and try not to lie about, hopefully, uh, their use of drugs, although I screen everybody in my clinic and it's amazing how many people won't tell you. So that would then beg the question, why are we not screening for these? Because those are definitely cofactors, and if you come in higher than a kite, Right on benzodiazepine. How can you give an informed consent? Yeah. Right, and if you're already impaired, so you're not giving, you're not being given a conformed consent because you're impaired. So perhaps part of that screening should be we screen everybody for one. We're supposed to screen for mental health, which they don't always do, and you should screen them for drugs. Get everybody a drug screen, right? Because it's dangerous to do the anesthetics and do all the other stuff we do, and it's not informed consent if you're already impaired by benzos or heroin or or some sort of other drug, right? So that sounds like a great idea, right? That we should, just like we talked about, should it be standard care, we screen for substances, because this is so important, right? This is so important in women's health care. Just to sort of say public health-wise, I mean, to, uh, because abortion's legal in Correct. this country, sure. your clinical treatment of saying, right, now I know you've had an abortion, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look after you, I'm going to try and make sure you don't have a preterm birth, right. is even more important why women in this country should know the risks at consent. Correct. And know that they actually need to tell their ops and gynae or their, their GP or whoever it is, Which is I it? might be at risk of a preterm birth so that they themselves right. Which is why have linked, the information. Which is why linked data, this is yet another you can see another reason why you need to have the data linked so that when practitioners see the patient, they can look and say, okay, they can talk to Mrs. You know, Mrs. Smith or Jones or whatever her name is, you know, I see in 19 whatever you had a surgical abortion, and I just wanted to make sure that that was the case, and that you know what, how many weeks that was, and I want to clarify because that's going to change how I take care of you. I want to enhance your prenatal care. I want to take the best care of you, and you know, thank goodness I've got that data now, so I can I can do a better job. Because if you don't tell me, which is I tell my patient, if you don't tell me, you're putting yourself and your baby at risk. You've got to tell me, please. It's going to change the way I take care of you. And virtually every woman, when you say that, because <laughs> they want that pregnancy, yeah. they will share that data with you. But you have to ask it multiple ways and usually more than once. It just it really does because there's still that whole that mystique, that whole thing of trauma. And I understand. I understand it entirely. I understand it. I get it. We had a question over here, right? No. Right. Considering right. And, the, and that's part of the whole issue. But of course, I always, you know, you can't really blame the victims, though. I always tell that's not really very fair to blame the victims. Say, well, just because you had mental health, you're more like, you know, you had your abortion, and now we're going to blame you because you have depression, and that was your fault anyway. So, it, you know, you were depressed because you, I know it's not your, that's, no, I know it's not, I'm not going to say, but that's what I hear from people. No, I'm going to say, but that's the thing is that when you see the literature, what that really means is you're going to blame somebody because they had mental illness, and now when they're depressed after their abortion, well, you were depressed anyway, so it's not the abortion's fault. Instead of saying, well, the abortion compounded that, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, my point is, is that these are vulnerable women who are seeking abortions. Absolutely. Need to... Absolutely. And there are many of them, if you look at the data, as you, as you pointed out, are vulnerable and they're being coerced. If you look at the data, 60 to 70 percent of women admit to being coerced or really strongly um, forced into doing abortions or forced into going and having abortions. I mean, that's, that's in the literature all over the place. There's a very high percentage of women are, are actually almost forcibly dragged in and, and have forced to have abortion by boyfriends and family members. It's, it's, it's really very sad, very sad stuff. It just really breaks my heart. It's just really sad stuff. It's really worth looking at the link between abortion and fertility after, you know, I know we talked about mental health, but like soft fertility afterwards, is because we're getting anecdotal. Right. The fertility clinics. The, um, the fertility issue, supposedly, if you look at the fertility issue, the question is, well, you know, about subfertility. The question, so the the the, sort, the whole thing is generally not unless you got infected. What does happen, however, is a lot of women who have abortions early on will delay their childbearing to get through school or get through other professional things or just life, and so they're much older when they start thinking about having children. So their fecundity starts going down at 30 or so. So by 30 to 35, they're already seeing a drop in fecundity. So those patients end up going 
to get fertility services because they've delayed childbearing and abortion was their child and then now they're faced with this whole thing about, you know, I had my child and now I don't have my child and now I want a child and I can't have my child. And it's, there's a lot of that sort of guilt and things that are just go, I'll go on around that whole, that whole topic. Again, vulnerable women who have had things and now they're doubly vulnerable because now they've got the infertility issue. That's very actually quite common, yes. Uh, Byron, to what extent would you think, uh, I mean, is the um, medical establishment or the, the sort of obstetric establishment fearful of litigation if they really own up to the effects of abortion on mm. women? Talking about the legal, the legal aspects, if you start owning up on it, well, I think it's hugely, they're hugely fearful because there's, there's lots of data out there now, and if you, if you engage it now, you're going to have to deal with the informed consent, and you're going to have to deal with subsequent care, which is why I think some obstetricians don't ask about this stuff. One, they don't want to know, or they don't know how to do it, right? General OBs don't deal with this sometimes very well. They just don't want to know. So if they don't know, they don't have to worry about it, right? <laughs> what you don't know can't hurt you. Well, it can, but you don't have to do anything. And so they don't want to deal with the, the, the issues that are around the whole abortion and pregnancy issue. And so then they can't be held liable for that preterm birth or whatever happens subsequent because they didn't know about it, right? So there's a lot of that, but they think there's a lot of fear that, you know, about the informed consents, except most of the time people that are doing abortions um, don't really have credentials anywhere in hospitals in my, in my country. They're itinerant and they go place to place and you can't find them to sue them, and people are reluctant to sue them. Women are very reluctant to, to bring this forth and sue their, the people that have done abortions and, and bring that to them. And then, of course, the American College is not real forthright about really pursuing this either, saying, you know, we need to talk about this uh, openly. If we're going to do it, we need to talk about this in terms of care. We really do need to talk about it. These, these things that are out there, even if you disagree, let's just at least get them out there so we can discuss them and we can, we can talk about them instead of just saying it doesn't exist. Yes, Peter. As you were saying earlier, one of the problems of preterm birth is a big increase in the incidence of cerebral palsy. Yes. And of course, all the attendant costs of care and the emotional cost on the family. Mm -hmm. Have there been any cases in the US, either of individual women or of class actions, uh, on grounds that they haven't been properly informed about the risk of preterm birth and that therefore they've been settled with huge emotional and financial costs. To my knowledge, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I don't know all of it. To my knowledge, there's not been anything on the preterm birth. There's been some breast cancer stuff done previously, but I'm not aware of a preterm birth at this point that I'm aware of that's been either class action or individually. That doesn't mean it isn't, but I suspect that will someday come out because it, it's clearly the literature is really pretty, pretty robust in this area actually uh, in terms of looking at the relative uh, the risks. But overall. Um, there's been 20 to 25 successful prosecutions of American doctors for failure to give informed choice, and, and at least three in Australia, and some in Canada. Uh, so it is happening. For preterm birth? I don't know about specifically preterm birth, right. but informed choice. Correct. Yeah, there's been some breast cancer uh, cases and some other cases. Absolutely, that's what I and, and I think that you're going to see. I think you will see more of this if we get the data out and people become more aware of what you know what should be done and how people should be taken care of and the, about informing people of their risks, future risks uh, for their fertility and or their reproductive outcomes uh, based on what we know about it right now. Yes, ma'am. Um, <laughs> For the breast cancer risk, I can give you I can give you sort of the high sort of the as I call it, the thirty thousand foot. I don't know all the details well. The bottom line for the breast cancer is it's a little and, and, and actually Peter Carroll's here. He can maybe he'll maybe help me out too eventually. But um, we know that if we look at large population studies and we look at the abortion um, being enacted, particularly in both the UK, which you have good data relatively speaking, and other countries, if you look at linked data, there's clearly when you look at breast cancer and you look at first pregnancy and ending and, and in a, an abortion, there's an increased risk for breast cancer. If you look at, compared to those who've never had an abortion, particularly you know, with first pregnancy, it's kind of hard to compare it to second pregnancies because of, we think that there's a protective effect with pregnancy. And we think that's because you have maturation of the, of the ducts and the breasts. So they become relatively resistant to, to cancer, quote unquote. So we think that because of that, it's the first pregnancy ending in abortion and or preterm. If you look at the data from the, the Danish studies, below 32 weeks delivery, so a preterm delivery. So think about this. 
abortion, 28-week delivery. Now, now, not only did you have a preterm delivery, you also have now an increased risk for breast cancer because you just had another preterm baby <coughs> below 32 weeks and you had a previous abortion. So that would increase your risk, quote unquote, for breast cancer because you have to go about 32 to 34 weeks. So there is, I think in the literature, there is definitely some good data and good epidemiologic population study data that shows that the risk has increased over time and a lot of it is right with, uh, with the, the abortion issue. The confounder we're having trouble with a little bit is hormonal contraception. And so that's the other, that's the wild card in that sometimes it's just a little hard to get to some of that data because we don't have all that with, with the abortion data which we, we know is also possibly linked to increased risk of breast cancer. Uh, in, in, in exposed populations. Yeah, yeah Joel Brind, breast cancer awareness whatever. Yeah, and uh, Lafrianchi too, Angela Lafrianchi. Yes. So, I mean, is it fair to say now just that the, that the jury is still out as to whether there's an increased risk in breast cancer? I don't think so. I think what there is is there's a lot of confusion out there probably somewhat. I think if you look at the risks for it, I think you can say probably there is, it's a little bit dif difficult sometimes because you do have the hormonal contraceptive idea in there as well. So yeah, probably it's sort of out there yet. So but, but because we had to, um, the, the pregnancy counseling center, which right. I was a trustee, mm -hmm. we had to take, we were forced to take something off our Mm -hmm. which said that the jury was still out mm -hmm. of this. Um, and I um, fought this a bit, but the, the reason why in the end we were told we had to do it was because the, the best studies that showed that there could be a link were Chinese, and until, until there were good Caucasian studies, they wouldn't allow us to have it. Well, they've actually had some other studies other places. <laughs> Yeah, there's some other places that have had actually. The, the Danish studies aren't too bad, some other stuff. The, the problem I have with is that this. For the, is that for the last couple of two or three years? No, it's a little bit older stuff. The problem I have with this, and they're just talking about the idea of the breast cancer being, you know, possibly the data is a little bit messy, and it is. The problem I have with that is then why, then why are we all worried about giving women who are perimenopausal uh, uh, estrogens? and other replacements for their, perimenop for their perimenopausal symptoms or menopausal symptoms. Mm -hmm. If we believe that, if we don't, I mean, if we don't want to give them estrogen because we're afraid they'll get breast cancer at 55, why are we not afraid that, you know, and, and they've had an abortion and we don't even know about it, right? Mm -hmm. Right? And it increases their risk maybe for breast cancer there, which we don't know. Why are you worried now, now you're not, but you're now suddenly not worried about young women you're exposing to abortion and, and hormones there. I, I don't understand the difference, in my, in my opinion, what, what, which, is, you know, which is true. You're giving them, you won't give them hormones at 55, but you're going to give them when they're 18. And they've both have been exposed to abortions. You just don't have the data, you're right. That's the problem, is the intellectual inconsistency. If it's not okay to give them when you're 55, why is it okay to give them when you're 18? We do have a lot more breast cancer. I had correspondence with Zaha Kumar, the boss of Cancer Research UK, who have at their disposal £10 million a year for cancer research. Yeah. And uh, he confirmed what I said in the paper last year, right. that our lifetime risk is not 1 in 8 and 1 in 7, yeah. by their own calculation. But yeah. you won't mind saying this, like other doctors, he's cavalier about statistics, and he prefers to say 1 in 8 rather than to correct it to 1 in 7. And he prefers not to acknowledge the in situ or in situ cancers. Right. Uh, so if we, if we wanted to answer the question, what's the lifetime risk of being treated for cancer? It's more like one in six. Much higher. Because um, my understanding is you, you recognize that I'm a statistician and an actuary and not, nothing. Yeah, in situ is tend to get treated like cancer. So what I understand from the medical docs is they tell the woman with the in situ cancer, yeah. don't worry, you haven't got cancer, we'll just treat you something as a precaution. Yeah. And the poor woman gets down the corridor to the place she gets treated. treated. She gets the full works being um, chemotherapy. Well, she gets treated usually in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. And of course, that's the purpose of the screening program. Right. To catch the cancers early. Yeah. Um, but Correct. But now we're still quoting that one in eight. It should really be one in six if you want to count the yeah. treatment. Yeah. yeah. Yes, ma'am. So, in, in my opinion, I've always seen abortion as an inelegant solution or the world's inelegant solution to the problem of society's failure to protect the vulnerable women. Mm -hmm. And much of, talk, much of your talk is very interesting, but it's targeted at clinicians. Right. How would you broach this with, with the scared, frightened woman that's come, in, come into your clinic? 
quite sure. Right, who's probably had an abortion before, right? And is feeling, you know. Sure. <coughs> well, I think a lot of us. I mean, frankly, I think. You know, the elephant's in the room is what I tell people. We're talking about acknowledging the, you know, the abortions and acknowledging the things that have happened. I think the problem is the elephant in the room. And like I said, it's like substance abuse in my world. It's the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about. What I find most helpful is to be basically very matter of fact. Very, very fact oriented, but very compassionate, saying, I want to know this for a reason. And what I also ask, are they, do they need help in any other way, shape, or form? Is there something else that they may need? Do they need to see a counselor? Do they need to talk to somebody about it? What, what can we do to help them? And let's get them through this pregnancy successfully and help support them throughout this. This, this pregnancy is going to be different for you. We're going to support you through this one, and we'll, we'll make this one the way you want it to be as much as we can. And I think the, the biggest issue is everybody wants to skirt around the issue, and it's frankly, What's done is done, and we need to deal with that and help them then be compassionate and help them work through to that with that pregnancy to become successful in this particular child and do the best we can to prevent the preterm birth, to treat them and take care of them and offer them mental health if they need it, support that they need it, more visits if they need it. Um, they can they even have people sometimes they can talk to if they want. There's people that have had previous abortions sometimes that people want to talk to, and we can do that as well. Done that before as well. So there's some people that are you know good with that, some people aren't. But I think the biggest issue is people just don't want to address the real issues, you know emphatically and say, look, this is what's going on. Let's, let's see what we can do to help and, and then listen to what they have to say and what they want and spend time. I mean, everybody gets, in my clinic, everybody gets the amount of time they need. Yeah. Not necessarily what you want, but what you need. Yeah. In, in Britain, I'd say that the care for the family are really very practical at trying to help someone who might be able to have a baby, but is financially unable to, can't see, mm -hmm. We have a lot of those resources too. Trying to put in help. I was just going to make another point. I don't know how many people are medical students here. How many medical students do I have? Because um, a couple there, back. One of the things you're taught <coughs> is that smoking is a big risk factor for premature birth. Correct. We were, we were discussing earlier that a paper come out in America. It's a very good paper, but actually there is a lot of confounding between smoking and women who've had abortions. In the past, they've measured risk of, uh, of, of preterm birth and smoking, but they didn't adjust to terminations of pregnancy. No. So you've got these confounding issues going on. Now, we're doing the study on, I'm, I'm Margaret Eames, by the way, and the person doing it with Greg. Um, so now we adjust for the other risk factors we know about, including smoking, but the other way around, we're now thinking that possibly it's the termination of wow. pregnancy that was contributing all the time to the tobacco to what they claim to be was tobacco, with. and it may not be so smoking. Actually, there are, there's, perhaps is a, a very big statistical yeah. um, sort of elephant in the room, really, that you can get go back and say, well, now the evidence is coming out. We right. have adjusted for all the other risk factors mm -hmm. that we know about, and. And, and termination of pregnancy is still a risk factor, and in fact, it's this big a risk factor. Right. Yeah. So, it, it, it actually, that's what we need to argue now. Yeah, the data is better, actually. It does need to yeah, be the data is better. Seriously. Yeah. You have a question? Yeah. Is it possible that all this mounting evidence is what's actually behind the abortion industry's push for full decriminalization here in the UK? Because sure. by the letter of the law, sure. it's meant to be an improvement to mental health to have an abortion. This, of course, threatens that. <laughs> Abortion on demand is already effectively available here, yeah. but by the letter of the law, it's, it's, it's a very dangerous position to be in if this evidence is showing that that's all a lie. Well, there you go. That's again, those, those are the whole, that's what I say. Every time you talk about data and you start talking about this, you understand why there's this shrill response because if you admit there's a problem, then you have to deal with it, all right? Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to deal with the fact that you've been doing it for a long time yeah. and you did it under false pretenses yeah. and now everybody who had that done yeah. for, you know, the 10 million women or however many million women have had this done, yeah. the answer is no. Yeah. And they've got every reason to say, wait a minute, how come you didn't tell me this when it's been known since the 1990s, yeah. right? You may not know in 68, but you've certainly known in the last 15 or 20 years that this, all this data was coming, or 10 years has been coming out. Yeah. yeah. And that's why they want to get rid of conscience. Yeah. Because then you have no argument, right? Well, you just need to go do this. Mm -hmm. Informed consent or not, you just need to go do this. Well, no, I don't actually, because I don't think it's good for you. Yes, ma'am. Um, this is more a, a comment than a question. Sure. But first of all, thank you very, very much for everything. My pleasure. Um,
And I am personally convinced that this whole issue of abortion and women's health is going to be the turning point in the tide of uh, ending <coughs> abortion I agree. around the world because it's just so strong. Yeah. And on either side of the debate, people are claiming that they care about women. Um, and I think eventually I agree. this is going to be what will win the battle. You're very welcome. I appreciate having me. It's um, it's it's been a it's been a interesting and long long road some days. But again, you know, I, I like I tell people, I'm uh, I'm in God's hands, and so I tell people, and that's what we were talking. Peter and I were talking. About, How do you keep at this? I said, and he probably said the same thing. I'm in God's hands, and when He chooses to move me, He will move me. When He chooses to remove me, He will remove me. When He opens a door, He'll open a door. If He closes it, He'll close it. And I never worry about whether or not that's going to be. A problem. I just worry about, you know, quote unquote, am I going to do what God wants me to do? That's my only concern. So I don't worry much about uh, the fact that, you know, this will be the here or there, or whatever. I'm just, I'm just required to tell the truth and to, to boldly go and tell the truth, and just let the facts speak for themselves because they really are. The truth is actually on our side for women. It truly is on our side. Mm -hmm. Other comments or questions? Are we about done here, Peter? You said you. What time can we done? Do you know? Okay. Well, you got any few more questions or anybody anything else, or you just want to go eat more food or? Yeah. Yes. Sure. I, I've worked a lot in um, crisis pregnancy counselling, and mm -hmm. something that I've noticed more, more recently, which is related to the question I asked, I think, before, is a growing tendency to say that the best abortion is done in your own home. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and sort of not even going back to the second dose, you can do it comfortably in your own home. Yeah. And I think this is very worrying. I've had some horrible yeah. calls from yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, it's like everything else. You know, it's going to be safe, legal, and rare. Yeah, we know how that turned out. And the best place to go is have your abortion at home so you can bleed to death. That always is a, that's always been very interesting to me. I've always said, well, that's not a very good idea, probably. And, of course, the problem we have is that they, clinics that do this stuff, they, you know, work from 9 to 3 or 8 to 4, and after 4 o'clock they're on their own. And so when you're starting to die at home, there's nobody to talk to or call. And so what happens, it ends up in my, in my world, in my ER, in my place. And it's infuriating to me, and I'll use the word infuriating, that I want cannot see, legislators will not see that that's wrong and terrible care of women and that they need to be held accountable. They need to have a way in which they should take care of their, their patients if that's what they are and they need to be responsible and held accountable for that, not abandoning their patients and pushing them in onto me. Not that I mind taking care of them, mind you, but I have no idea what went on. I have no idea what's going on and I'm very, I'm very frustrated by that whole issue, that they're not held the same standard I am at all, at all. Very frustrating. It's worth just going, just going back to breast cancer and Maggie's concern. I think it's, I think, I think it's good to reassure people on, on the, the breast cancer link. I mm -hmm. mean, I didn't want to put it in this book mm -hmm. because it was so controversial mm -hmm. and right. difficult. And the more I looked at it, the more I thought, no, 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 this is a really good case. Mm -hmm. And it's <coughs> along with uh, premature birth, I, th I think there's a really good case for the Bradford Hill causality mm -hmm. link. Right, I think it's going to be one of those things, again, like uh, with, with Margaret's talked about, as we get better and better with and better data and we get better at looking at and asking the right questions and asking the right uh, things about what we need in terms of confounders, we'll get better data. We'll get purer data. In fact, what may be happening with the breast cancer thing, we're underestimating it because we were actually, the effects of the contraceptives and the hormones are actually blunting that effect and hiding it. It may be much higher than we thought. It could be the other way around. So, you know, that's the part that's why we need good data. Worth saying that in the ten years since the, uh, well, eleven years since the, uh, a major British statement on this by an uh, Oxford prof professor, there's been 45 papers about the abortion breast cancer link. Uh, uh, what well, 46, and all 45 have shown a positive link. Four, and one was. Right. There's a simple argument. I mean, there's a lot of breast cancer, 50,000 cases a year. <laughs> That's right. And preterm births gone up, same thing. Yeah. We first had uh, large numbers of women having legally induced abortions in the 1970s. We first had large numbers of women using hormonal contraceptives in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. When these women get to the age 50 plus, when mm -hmm. they're lucky to have the breast cancer that is reflective of these episodes in their um, uh, reproductive history. Right. Right. Uh, Lo and behold, we have a lot of breast cancer, which is not otherwise easily explained, right. than by 
the, uh, right. the floodgates opening for right. um, abortions in, in our country yeah. from that 1967 Abortion Act, right. and the um, heavy government promotion and widespread yeah. use of hormonal contraceptives. Right. right, and the other elephant in the room that nobody talks about again is if you look at having a baby between the ages of about 18 and 25, certainly before 30, mm -hmm. your risk for breast cancer is about half of what it would be if you've never had an, if you don't have an abortion and or use hormonal contraceptives. So it's about half. So that's the flip side of it. If you go to term, have your baby before you're 30, which is not unreasonable, even if you're going to quote unquote go to your whole career, whatever you want to do, right? I understand that. Although the other flip side is why can't you just go to school and have a child? I don't understand that. Seems, that's always been a little weird to me anyway. But I mean, you know, I had you know, my children while I was a medical, well, I was a medical student resident, so I mean, I was my wife, so I still had to be a dad and go to medical and do all the stuff, right? So I always found that weird, but it decreases the risk of breast cancer. Why do we flip the argument around and say, why are we not telling our young women the best thing you can do for your health for breast cancer, one, not do the abortions, two, not use hormonal contraceptives if possible, which I think is doable, and have your children before you're 30, at least one, right? And go to term and or breastfeed. It's actually going to term. Breastfeeding is helpful too, but going to term. That's how you decrease your risk for breast cancer. Not, not really complicated, but nobody likes to hear that argument either very much, right? It's not very popular on you. Yeah. The, problem, the, the problem with previous abortion reform, <coughs> partly, is the long lag time between when the yeah. abortion happens Exposures and, then and when it. they get the breast cancer. Right. And in between, other things can happen that may be risk factors for right. breast cancer. Right. So Valerie Beryl, Professor Valerie Beryl, who took over from Richard Dole in Oxford as the Professor of Epidemiology, was quite a feminist and didn't really want there to be any side effects of abortion at all. I know that's her, where she comes from. I, I, I often meet her at epidemiology conferences. She re that's what she argued 10 years ago. No, 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 there isn't any um, link. Now, and she's a cancer epidemiologist now. Now, what we need are really good statistical studies, like Joel Friend is trying to do in America, where he's adjusted for all these other factors that we do know are risk factors for breast cancer. Right. A bit like for preterm birth, we have to adjust for right. smoking and the other factors we right. do know are risk factors. Mm -hmm. So gradually we're getting this, this research done. Right. Poor old Joel Friend has been a bit of an outlier out in America. He's had lots of <laughs> Yeah, he and Angela have been kind of, you know, a little bit pariahs. He, he yeah. Is, <laughs> together some very good epidemiology and we need some more done in Britain but we haven't got the data yet so we need the well, CMO yeah. to put the NHS number <laughs> On the abortion. What we, what we really need, frankly, now this is sort of, I know I'm being a bit sort of selfish about this, we just need young physicians and uh, other providers who are interested in, you know, taking the torch, right? None of us are going to get out of life alive. I'm aging, all the people I know are aging. We're all, no, we are, we're all getting older. And we need people who have the passion and the desire and the will and the intellectual capability, which I'm sure you all have, to carry this forward and do better than we've done. I mean, the, the, the best part of being a, a, a teacher or father or parent, whoever you are, mother, is your children doing better than you. And I would love to see this torch passed on, as I say, like the Olympic torch, if you will, and just make you make things better and learn more and do more with this thing and really seriously do some good, good research and, and do some really wonderful things. And get involved in it. And just see if you like it or not. Put your toe in there. Help with the paper. And if you don't, that's okay. But if you are excited as I am and passionate about it as I am, then this is the place for you to be and do it because you'll never be bored, that's for sure. Thank you very much. You've been very good. <laughs>